one of the things I've been working with is to stay open hearted. So for me, open hearted doesn't mean it's a Disney movie. It doesn't mean that it's we're ignoring all of the challenges ahead. It just means that we're trying to stay with an open heart. So family and friends are part of this mix here. And, you know, when we, when we think about family, we think about all different kinds of relationships. The one in the middle there is my son and I in 1982, I think it was, I started the Lesbian Mothers Defense Fund. And that's uh, a picture from the paper there. So that's one kind of family, lesbian family. And uh, the one just to the left of that is two gay men, Neil Patrick Herricks, who many of us knew as Doogie Hauser MD when he was just a kid. And their family, their adopted daughters, and um, and just all the different kinds of families that we have. And family is oftentimes a chosen family, too. It's not just our biological family. And families, we've we've worked a lot with family and relationships in different in different groups, and it's complicated. And we don't we don't live in these kinds of families that show up in these perfect pictures with everybody smiling and connected. And yet we all really long for that. That we want to be in a family, whether that's a community, not necessarily biological, but our communities. And that's part of what's been happening in the in the United States and around the world is that we're we're really looking at where do I belong and where am I safe? And so I wanted to start with a kind of couple of pictures of this. And friends, like the the picture from the TV series there and the Golden Girls, those aren't necessarily real either. I mean the conflicts that they have in those, you know, sitcoms sometimes kind of touch into real life, but we have these ideas in our head that that life should be like that. And so I also included some real life pictures of famous people, but who are actually who have close friendships as well. And Oprah and Gail's friendship is kind of legendary. And, uh, and, and a lot of the other ones too. So we have these, these feelings of envy in a way, I wish I had that or appreciation if we do have that but also as adults we know that it's not our lives are not like that necessarily there's a lot more going on so then we get into our situation to just to bring COVID into it which is everybody's been so not everybody but a lot of people have been very focused on the American election right in this last little while and also, at the same time, the COVID cases are rising all over the world as we get into more indoor things and as people get sick of social distancing. And so during this pandemic, we have this feeling of, I should feel safe with my family or with my bubble or with my close friends. And yet I don't know who has COVID, who's asymptomatic and who might spread it. And so we have this kind of mixture of safe, not safe, threatened not threatened. And one of the realities is that we don't know who's in other people's bubbles. So I feel like it's kind of not dealing with reality when we think of here where I live in Nova Scotia, there's these 10 person or 15 person maximum size of gatherings. But when you bring people in from all these different bubbles, and then they get together with 10 or 15 people, and then they go and get together with another 10 or 15 people, your bubble actually gets pretty big. And that's partly why I think we're seeing some of the the rise in cases. So we have this uneasiness around who's in their bubbles and are they being careful enough and what, what are their possible exposures and am I safe? And we feel, we feel threatened personally, but also for, for people we love. And then to get to, you know, to tie that in with the situation that's been happening around the rise of uh, fascism and Donald Trump in particular in the United States, what that represents, and our hardwired nervous system. The bottom of the slide refers to this uh, program, the On Being um, interview with Arlie Hochschild, and talking about these deep stories. And we looked at that a little bit last week. So our deep story is what feels true, regardless of the facts. And we repel facts that don't fit in and invite facts that do. 
And the question is, can we be authentic and unguarded, take off our armor, and actually make connections with people on the other side, what we call the other side? So it matters how we define our insider group and what we think about the people in the outsider group. So if we look at the way humans evolved over millennia, we evolved in small groups, family-based, usually 30 to 50 people. Anything more than that, it was too difficult to get food in the hunter-gatherer culture. And so we had, you know, a little bit of extended family where we might, you know, kind of gather together with another small group at times. But for the most part, our insider group, we had to stay in that and we had to we had to stay connected in that in order to survive because we were going to die if we didn't. So we have that in our evolution. And then the outsider group, those were often the ones who were competing with us or who were dangerous to us in some way. And Trump really played on those fears in terms of, he's not the only one, of course, there's, there's other ones, but he's kind of the, the leader of that. And so he would use this fear to raise this perceived level of threat. Of threat. So his people, his, the people he's including, the people he's protecting, are in danger from those people. And I think it works from the other side too. So for me, those people are dangerous. And it's really easy to kind of get into a hard kind of a situation with that. So we look at this, this slide here. Immigrants don't scare me, Trump supporters do. And we have this stereotypical anger. I mean, those faces are scary. Those are people who are out of control. And, you know, the people with the Nazi flags, the people with the, you know, the, the automatic guns standing on the steps of a, of a legislature. These are people who are extremists and they are a real threat. And then the question is, is this actually representative of the whole there was millions of people who voted for Trump in this election. Are they all like that? And if they are all like that, then yes, we're definitely in trouble. I don't believe that they are. They can't be. But this fear of an actual threat, there are some people that are like that. The fear just kind of narrows us into this insider-outsider, and then we harden our hearts. Another thing that happens that's kind of feeds into this is the what if or catastrophic thinking. So we have our primitive brain that says those people are a threat and we don't know what they're going to do. And then we start to go into this, which is it's useful to some extent. What's going to happen next? How can I keep myself safe? But what really is going on is that for the most part, we're not going to help anybody with that kind of catastrophic thinking. All we're going to do is alarm our own nervous system. And we're not going to be able to keep ourselves safe because we're going to be so anxious and so revved up that we can't accurately see threat. So we go from this feeling threatened and then we go to, how am I going to work with this? So part of it is, you know, when we're talking about I still feel the level of threat. I still feel like there's something wrong. And we don't want to go into denial. We don't want to go into, it'll all be okay now that, that Biden-Harris won the ticket, they're president-elect and vice president-elect. We don't also need to go into, you know, what's going to happen in the next couple of months. We need to be, you know, aware, but also nobody here has any control over that. All we have is what might happen, our worries about that, the feeling of threat in our body. And so we want to be responsible adults. We want to use our mindfulness practice and use our own open hearts to stay connected with ourselves, with each other in this small group, and with each other in our larger communities. And one thing that I've been really noticing over the last day or so is that a lot of people are talking about reaching out to all Americans, and Biden was talking about 
I'll be the president for everyone. I'm an American president. I'm not a president just for Democrats. So there does seem to be this um, kind of appetite in, in the United States for healing and feeling like there's this, this war that's been going on and now it's coming to a close. We're taking a deep breath. We're celebrating and we long, we long for this connection with each other. And part of what, you know, part of what we're feeling and part of what we're hearing from other people too is how distressing it's been to feel so divided. And how can we really create a, a community, whether it's, you know, in the United States, I'm Canadian, but we're all so affected by this. And how can we do this in our own communities, our small places where we live, in the wider communities of a, you know, a, a, an area that's bigger with millions of people, perhaps, or how can we, how can we keep an open heart is what I keep coming back to. Because it's only with an open heart that we can have a clear assessment of the situation and that we can have the willingness to reach out to other people and to connect with each other. So I wanted to leave a lot of time today for some inquiry. So at this structure, if it works for you, is on the left and it could be out front, it could be whatever, wherever you want it. But here are all of my beliefs and conditionings, the fears. And we're not in any way saying that those are wrong. Conditioning and beliefs are based on our personal experience. And it's a good thing that we have a primitive brain that keeps track of that. That's the negativity bias that we talk about. Because if we didn't, we would always keep going and getting into the same kind of danger. We would never know to watch out for that. And it can get really heightened and not really serve us. So if you were to imagine that in one area in space is all of your conditioning, your fears, I can't trust those people, all of the fears. But then imagine what would it be like if they were all gone? Like if there were no fears left. And this isn't kind of a Disney imagination either. It's not like it's not like we have to make the world a certain way in order for us to be free. It's more that can I do some inquiry, which we'll get into in a minute, and really look at those fears, really look at the conditioning and the beliefs that happened in response to my experiences. And allow all of that to be here just as it is. We're not talking about denial. And stay grounded and clear-eyed and open-hearted. So let's start there. The space of open-heartedness. The space of willing to be connected of wanting to be connected with other people, of not wanting to exclude anybody from the human family. And as I said those words, I could feel some resistance coming in. Well, yeah, but not those people. Those people need some kind of, they need to change somehow because they're a threat to me. So let's, let's start from the freedom and look and see what it is that's limiting our freedom. So when we start with freedom, we're starting with a maturity and a steadiness that I don't need everything to be a certain way. I don't need everybody to, you know, be dancing in the meadow with sunshine and bluebirds. It's not like that. Can I be free from all of the fear conditioning that contracts me and gets me into black and white thinking? And so with the reverse inquiry is one of the ways that we we bring forward what's holding us back from being free is that we'll say something that we have a sense isn't true. 
and then we see what the resistance is. So some of the beliefs and fears are that we don't know what's going to happen and we don't feel safe when we don't know what's going to happen. We have those stereotypes about Trump voters are, and we kind of label them all. If Even if we don't feel like these are the violent right-wing extremists, we might still feel that they're deluded somehow, that they're brainwashed, they're in a cult, because we can't understand why somebody would vote for someone like that. So, again, we're not saying that any of these things are wrong. You know, we have evidence. There are some people that certainly seem to not wish us well. And there's people who also just have a very different view of things. For whatever reason, their experience has led them to a different way of looking at the world. So keeping all of this in mind, the balance of our fears and conditioning and our wish to be free and grounded and steady, open-hearted. You could use one of these inquiries or one of your own. One of them is I'm willing to stretch out my hand to listen, try to understand and find common ground. And the other one is I'm willing to look deeply into my own fear and contempt of the other side. That seems to be a little bit more of a direct, harder hitting practice. So however that might be for you, and as you're doing it, remain aware of your body. It'll take several minutes for this, so we'll have a bit of time. But stay connected with your breath. You need to open your eyes to do the senses, five things I can see, do some tapping. Keep coming back to your breath, back to your body and the safety that you're in right now. What is in the way of freedom? And if you're listening to this on a recording, take as much time as you want. Just put it on pause and then come back to it. And allow yourself to stay focused. You could always come back to the freedom. Especially if you're getting really caught up in the conditioning. You come into this inquiry. So if I'm grounded and steady or... Can I allow myself to feel fear and other emotions? What's in the way of that? It might be an energy in your body. You could work with directly connecting with that energy, seeing the space all around it, asking why it's here. Thoughts in the mind. Stay connected with your breath and your body as you're looking. And over the next minute or so, bring the inquiry to a close. Make a note of what you'd like to follow up with. And bring yourself back to freedom. To whatever extent you feel free, grounded, open, clear-eyed. And I wanted to bring in as well 
the reality of the situation. If you haven't yet watched Van Jones, there's a clip that CNN put on YouTube of his response when Anderson Cooper asked him how he's doing with the news of the Biden Harris um, being the election being called. And he talked about the relief and how hard it has been for people of color and black people and other people who've been really a target of the Trump administration. And how it wasn't just George Floyd who couldn't breathe. It's the whole community. The fear of not knowing when you leave the house, if you're going to be able to get home that night, or if you're going to be killed on the way home. And the fear of what's going to happen for our friends and our family and and people that we care about. So when we're talking about freedom, we're talking about it on the level of our own hearts and minds, and we're not talking about being deluded. We're talking about a really clear acceptance of this is the reality, that people are different from us, and that some of them are threatening to us. And all that we can really do is to work on having an open heart and a clear, clear sight. And can we have enough space in our hearts to bring in the reality of the situation for ourselves, but also for other people and for black people and other people of color? Can we let in the reality of their lives? And can we work? hard to change that reality. And part of that recovery involves working with our own fears, working with our own tendency to go into denial or to go into scapegoating someone else, or falling for the stereotypes of the people that aren't in our insider group. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge for us all to take up in whatever way we're moved to do that. What kind of a world do we want to live in? And then to celebrate this weekend and to celebrate that there was a big no to the rise of fascism and the the threats against democracy in the United States. And that there's a lot of work to be done in our own hearts as well as in our communities. If you wanted, you could put a hand on your heart or both hands on your heart. Give yourself that warmth and comfort of true connection. I'm here. I'm here for myself. I'm here for others. I'm here. And then when you're ready, open your eyes.